First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Good evening and welcome to First at Five from WUFT News. I'm Jacob Sedesi. And I'm Alexis Clevenger. Thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news this evening. A, a New, New York... A New York jury has found two Trump Organization companies guilty on multiple charges of criminal tax fraud and falsifying business records. Prosecutors said top executives of the Trump organizations participated in a 15-year scheme to avoid paying personal income taxes on job perks such as rent-free apartments and luxury cars. Former President Donald Trump and his family were not charged in this case, but prosecutors repeatedly mentioned him during the trial and connecting him to the benefits doled out to the executives. The Trump organizations could face a maximum of more than $1.6 million in fines when sentenced next month. That penalty isn't expected to be severe enough to jeopardize the future of Trump's company. And Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is facing Republican candidate Herschel Walker in today's runoff in Georgia. Florida Senator Rick Scott is in Georgia again today to show support for Walker. NBC's Alice Barr is following the race from Washington, D.C. On this runoff election day in Georgia, voters are fired up. We win. Have someone to be and uh, to fight for me to, you know, make decisions that are best for me and my family. We're going to get this done one more time. Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock facing off against Republican challenger Herschel Walker, who greeted supporters today at a Marietta restaurant. I feel good. I feel good. We're going to win this election. But while rain didn't stop early morning voters in Atlanta, another factor may dampen Republican turnout. What we're hearing from some Republican voters is because control of the Senate isn't on the line. That's dampening some of that enthusiasm. Democrats retained control of the Senate by the narrowest possible margin and are looking to expand their majority with a Warnock win. I really want him back. He's got the experience. Warnock edged past Walker in last month's general election, but didn't get to 50% of the vote. The Democrat built up an advantage in the runoffs, record-breaking early vote count, but Republicans tend to show their strength on election day, and many are motivated by a chance to slow President Biden's agenda in the Senate. At the end of the day, is this more about Herschel Walker or more about a Republican seat? A Republican seat. Warnock far outspending Walker in this runoff, slamming the Republican over numerous scandals, while Walker's casting the Democrat as a rubber stamp for President Biden's policies. The final contentious and consequential race of the 2022 midterms now coming to a close. Well, Jacob, it still feels quite warm out for it to be December. I know. I hope we get some cold weather here before break starts. Yes. WUFT's Dara Getter is actually here now to tell us about the weather forecast. Dara, will my wish come true? Well, unfortunately, Jacob, your wish won't be coming true. I'm sorry. It feels like 79 out with temperatures in the upper 70s. We have an area of high pressure that was sitting directly above us earlier today, which is why we didn't see many clouds in the sky this morning, and it's currently moving away, but that's what's contributing to our warmer temperatures. This evening, we're going to be cooling down into the low 60s. I'll have more on that as well as the tropical disturbance that we're tracking coming up in my full forecast. Back to you. Thanks, Dara. The Alachua County Commission voted to spend $1.25 million in federal aid to upgrade the Santa Fe Hills water system. The Alachua County Commission unanimously voted to spend federal funding on the improvement of an unincorporated neighborhood's water infrastructure. The funds are being used to upgrade the deteriorating water infrastructure for the unincorporated neighborhood of the Santa Fe Hills. The $1.25 million is a part of the $52 million allocated to Alachua County through the American Rescue Plan Act. This stimulus package was passed by Congress and signed into law by the Biden administration in March 2021 to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. People living on empty land next to Alachua County's largest homeless shelter must now evacuate out of fear of arrest. The few dozen people living on the empty land next to Grace Marketplace were told to evacuate before December 1st. Grace is the only place many of these people can go. It's the county's only shelter for single adults who are not fleeing domestic violence. About half of the campers were on the trespass list for Grace, which was already at capacity. And the future of a historic Gainesville Community Center is unknown after the building is left in unsafe conditions. 
The historic Thelma Bolton Center, once used as an entertainment spot for Gainesville residents, is now falling apart. The Gainesville City Commission approved plans for a comprehensive renovation in 2019. But after delayed renovation plans, pandemic shutdowns, and out-of-date construction, the city is unsure about the future of it. A structural engineer assessed the building in 2021 and left the city with two options, demolish it or complete extensive renovation to keep it standing. The Board of Commissioners will meet today to decide the future of the building. The city of Gainesville will now allow sex offenders to live closer to areas where children are likely to be found. The city commission passed an amendment allowing people convicted of sexual offenses involving children under the age of 16 to live closer to schools, daycare centers and parks. The amendment also establishes a cutoff date that was previously but recognized by the city. People convicted before the ordinance was at first adopted in 2005 no longer have this restriction. When it applies, the city ordinance now matches the state law with a limit of 1,000 feet. The Florida Supreme Court will close arguments Wednesday in a case that raises the question, are police officers victims when they shoot someone in the line of duty? The court is considering whether officers who use deadly force to be victims of threats leading to harm are protected under Marcy's Law. The Marcy's Law initiative began in California to ensure crime victims have equal rights on the same level as the accused and convicted. Now, two Tallahassee police officers have invoked the law, claiming they were victims threatened by crime suspects. And a Florida deputy faces a manslaughter charge for an accidental fatal shooting. Authorities say Deputy Andrew Lawson thought he was jokingly pointing an unloaded weapon at his roommate, fellow Deputy Austin Walsh, when the firearm went off. Lawson turned himself in this weekend. If convicted, a manslaughter charge in Florida can lead to up to 15 years in prison. Sheriff Wayne Ivey called the shooting a, quote, extremely dumb and totally avoidable accident. A person is in custody after an elderly Florida couple was killed outside of their home on Saturday. Officials say the shooter was their neighbor who was angry following an HOA encounter. The shootings happened Saturday afternoon in the Cedar Point 55 and up community near Stewart. Officials said 75 year old Hugh Hootman shot his downstairs neighbors Henry and Ginger Wallace, both 81. Police say Ginger's role as the HOA president was a factor in the shooting. Hootman was arrested with and charged with two counts of first degree murder. A county in North Carolina is on its third day without power. And authorities are currently investigating the cause of these outages. We'll tell you what officials believe is causing this when we return. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome back. A small town in North Carolina is dealing with a state of emergency from what authorities are calling a targeted attack on the area's power grid. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Carthage, North Carolina with the latest. Well, for more than 30,000 people here in Moore County, North Carolina, this is the start of the third straight day of no power. We spoke with a representative for Duke Energy who says they are getting some power back on slowly but surely, but the vast majority of the customers who were impacted by this are not going to see their power restored until sometime Thursday. You know, even with crews working around the clock, this truly is a painstaking process. They say that the damage was so extensive in some areas that some of the parts have to be simply replaced. That means taking time to ship some of the parts in. And meanwhile, of course, officials are still working to determine who's responsible for this. We have local, state and federal officials who are all looking into this. When I spoke with the sheriff here in Moore County, he made it clear that whoever is responsible knew what they were doing. It's somebody who had some sort of knowledge of how the power system works in order to be able to break in and essentially take it out. Duke Energy says that their security measures are industry standards and they're regulated, but they say they're going to be taking some closer looks at the safety precautions in wake of what happened. Meanwhile, the curfew goes into effect again at 9 o'clock tonight, and this county remains under a state of emergency. Back to you. A delivery driver is accused of abducting and killing a seven-year-old girl in Texas. Police issued an amber alert for Athena Strand after she disappeared last week. Her body was found days later, and now a suspect is under arrest. Police say 31-year-old Tanner Horner delivered a package to her home the day she went missing. He's charged with kidnapping and murder. The sheriff says Horner confessed, but the sheriff did not want to say anything about the motive or manner of death. 
And Congress presented gold medals today to law enforcement officials, officials who defended the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. During a ceremony in the Capitol Rotunda, Congress's highest honor was presented to the men and women who protected the Capitol and members of Congress. Supporters of then-President Trump overran the building that day, but Capitol Police officers managed to escort members of the House and Senate to safety. One officer died after the attack, two others later killed themselves, and dozens more suffered wounds and psychological trauma. Dara is back and she's here to tell us more about the weather. Dara, should we be concerned about what we're seeing in the tropics? Absolutely not. It's actually expected to move northeast into cooler waters and begin to weaken. I'll have more on that as well as your full forecast coming up after the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. Earlier today, we had this area of high pressure sitting directly above our area, which is why we didn't see as many clouds in the sky this morning, but it's moving away from us, giving that chance for some more clouds to build up, sitting right above Jacksonville right now, but still leaving us with some pretty warm temperatures this evening in the upper 70s, 78 in Gainesville, with things feeling a little bit cooler on the coast in the low 70s south of Jacksonville. This evening, we'll be seeing partly sunny skies as that sun begins to set mostly cloudy skies tonight and Apache fog developing early Wednesday morning. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to be cooling down to temperatures in the low 60s tonight. It feels like 79 right now. Your low in Gainesville tonight will be 59 and south of us we will be seeing temperatures in the upper 50s as well. Things looking a bit similar to what we saw last night. Um, you can see that fog beginning to develop early Wednesday morning, becoming more dense in some areas than others, but generally pretty widespread. It'll start to break up at the end of those morning commute hours. Tomorrow you'll be seeing sunny skies with a light breeze picking up in the afternoon, and we're going to be warming up tomorrow to temperatures in the 80s. 80 in Gainesville with temperatures in the low 70s south of Jacksonville. We're also tracking a tropical disturbance, but it's nothing to be concerned about just yet. It has a 50% chance of becoming a cyclone within the next two days, and by Thursday or Friday, it's expected to move northeast into cooler waters, thus breaking up a bit and becoming more weak. So I don't think it's anything that we should be freaking out about just yet. Over the next couple of days, we'll be seeing temperatures in the upper 70s to low 80s. We do have a cold front moving through on Sunday, which will be cooling us down on Monday into the low 70s. Back to you. Thanks, Dara. If you're interested in low intensity sports, Gainesville Petanc might be what you are looking for. Petanc is a French sport that is played with metal balls called boules that are thrown toward a marker ball. Gainesville Petanc was founded in 2017 and currently holds 50 members. Sarah Lauerman, the president and founder of the club, wants people to know that the sport is open to anyone, regardless of age and experience. The club's oldest member is 93-year-old Raul Bermejo, who joined in 2021. Bermejo attends the meetups a couple of times every month. And speaking of sports, our very own Taylor Burr is here. Yeah, that's right. The Gators women's basketball team is looking to keep their winning streak alive, right, Taylor? Yes, it's a big game tonight for Florida. Learn up about the matchup when we come back. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome to sports. I'm Taylor Burr. Tonight, the UF women's basketball team meets Presbyterian for the first time in four years. The Gators are currently 8-1 and in the midst of their best start in seven years. WUFT's DJ McCatherine is at the O-Dome to tell us more about the game. I'm here at the Stephen C. O'Connell Center where the Florida Gators women's basketball team is preparing to take on Presbyterian. The Gators are coming off a big win at Dayton on Sunday where they extended their win streak to six games. Coming into tonight's game, senior Leilani Correa is averaging 16 points per game for the Gators. She will duke it out against sophomore Mara Niera, who is averaging 13 points per game for the Blue Hose. Presbyterian is coming off a tough loss against Jacksonville on Saturday, but look to get back on track. 
this is, now this is only the second time that these two teams have matched up against each other. The first time the Gators came up on top 60 to 46. Tip off for tonight's game is set for 6 p.m. Reporting live with WUFT Sports, I'm DJ McCaffrey. The Gator men's basketball team is on the court tomorrow night as they get ready to host fifth ranked UConn. UF is currently on a two game winning streak after beating both Stetson and Florida AM last week. The Gators will need a big night from senior Colin Castleton as he'll go face to face with Husky star player Adama Sinago, who averages 19 points and 7 rebounds per game. Castleton has been the Gators' best player all season, with averaging 16 points and 7 rebounds. Florida's yet to make a statement win, but they'll have the opportunity this Wednesday against undefeated top five ranked team in the country, UConn. Game time is set for 9 p.m. tomorrow. Moving to volleyball, Florida gets ready for their NCAA regional semifinal Thursday against Pittsburgh. The Gators swept both opponents in the first weekend of the tournament, defeating both Florida A&M and six seed Iowa State. Florida has dominated the field, averaging 13 kills per set, two and a half blocks, and three aces. They will rely heavily on Marina Markova and Mara Benson, who tallied 18 kills combined over the weekend. Game time is set for 3.30 Thursday. Moving to the gridiron, Hawthorne High will return for their third state championship and they'll play Northview. Going into Saturday, the Hornets and Chiefs both have perfect records and are coming off impressive state semifinal victories. Hawthorne won 28 to nothing over Blountstown and Northview beat Union County 21 to 11. This is the Hornets' third straight appearance in the state championship game, having lost their previous two appearances. Game time is set for Saturday at 7 p.m. in Tallahassee. Thanks, Taylor. Now, before we go, let's take one last look at the weather. Dara, take it away. Well, this evening we'll be seeing partly sunny skies as that sun begins to set. Mostly sunny skies overnight tonight. And as we head into early Wednesday morning, we're going to start to see some patchy fog develop. It might be dense in your area, so be aware of that on your morning commute tomorrow. You'll be waking up to temperatures in the low 60s. Daytime high on Wednesday is 80 degrees in Gainesville with things feeling a bit cooler along the coast in the low to mid 70s as we head closer to Central Florida and Daytona Beach. Over the next couple of days, we're going to be seeing temperatures in the upper 70s to low 80s. We do have a cold front that we're tracking that's going to be moving in on Sunday, which will be cooling us down to temperatures in the low 70s next week. Back to you. Thanks, Dara. Before we sign off, it's our last Tuesday together as a team. Dara, Alexis, Taylor, I just want to say I have loved working with all of you. I know. I'm going to miss working Tuesdays with you guys. Yeah, it's I'm been great. Miss you. It's been great. Tomorrow's the last day of First at Five for the semester, but I wanted to wish my co-anchor Alexis farewell as it's her last show today with WUFT. Mm -hmm. Alexis, I remember mixing the audio in the booth for you last semester, and I've always wanted to work with you, so it's just an honor to be able to sit at this desk oh, next to you. Well, Jacob, I'm so sad, and I've loved working with each and every one of you, and it's been a pleasure to tell your stories right here in North Central Florida. Uh, I'd be looking forward to my next journey starting in January. We are all rooting for you, Alexis. Yes. Do you want to close out the show for the last time? I would love to. Well, your Florida news is always on at WUFT.org. Have a good night and a wonderful holiday.